There were several steps Elliot took away from his own self-interests in 1997. He was in a mode of escape, it seems. Portland was stale, a west coast Texas where too many emotional bombs had exploded. As Krebs said succinctly, there was too much shit there. The local rock god role was tough to take. Everywhere he turned, he knew someone who looked at him sideways with expectations, assumptions, requests. Early in the year, he was of a mixed mind. First, he'd just mulled over taking off for New York, but hadn't foreclosed on the possibility. The idea was that there he could be just anybody. He craved anonymity, a nowhere man sort of existence. On the other hand, the prospect seemed doubtful. My problems won't be any different in New York than they are here, he realized initially. Also, I can't pretend any more like I could be just anybody. There are things about me that would be present in New York just the same as here. So the idea had been put on hold for a time. This is where I'm from, Elliot told Chandler and Wagner in 1997, referring to Portland, and I'm going to stick with it. That decision reversed itself, however. The trouble was, although staying in Portland may have saved his life, it was a place that, on balance, checked his more dangerously self-destructive instincts, a place where guilt kept him sequestered from possibly disastrous dalliances, lures <clears throat> such as heroin. It also locked him into various dilemmas. In Portland, the endless stream of reminders he wrote about in Last Call, the ones he'd gotten so sick of kept guard around any corner. But apart from desiring relative anonymity, another reason behind thoughts of taking off somewhere new, about as far as he could get in the U.S., had to do with girlfriend Joanna Baum. Baum is an elusive person in Elliot's story. Although the two were very close, and although Baum knew Elliot intimately for longer than most anyone else in his life, and was thus an extraordinarily important person for him, one also deeply connected to the music side of things, she rarely has gone on record to talk about their relationship, or even about Elliot apart from the relationship. An understandably private individual, particularly on this subject, Bohm's friends even mention her reticence, how she kept her feelings close. She always seemed to some hard to read, distant, occasionally abrupt, difficult to click with. In short, she was a mystery with what appeared to be a lot going on inside, and just like Elliot himself, she was not the sort of person who ever easily or readily opened up to others. She and Elliot first met in 1991, just after he moved back to Portland from college. A friend introduced them. Elliot kind of waved and was shy, she says. <clears throat> Still, she did not get to know him well until some time later when she worked at a bar. That's when we became friends. It was Neil Gust, in fact, who played matchmaker. I made him talk to her, he recalls. I made him do it. At the time, he'd been aware of Bohm only from afar, and he didn't come away with a comfortable feeling. Far from it. She scared the shit out of me, he says, and I was totally intimidated. According to Gust, Elliot figured Joanna was out of his league. He guessed she wouldn't give him a second look. But Gust says, I was like, she is fucking hot. Don't be afraid. She'll love you. In truth, he wasn't sure himself that Elliot stood a chance, but Elliot had always encouraged him whenever he had a crush on someone, so Gust returned the favor. It was his birthday. We were at La Luna, where Joanna bartended, and I kept nudging him. They ended up playing pool together. They had this lovely chemistry, Gust recalls. He asked her out. It was so lovely. In agreement with what most everyone says about Elliot, a collective effort to offset all the talk about his crippling depressions, Bohm alludes to how funny he was, his droll, straight man sense of humor, his aslant take on things, especially all things pompous or self-admiring. He was pretty gregarious once you got to know him, Bohm adds. And although he was always uncomfortable with being human and getting through life, he was still a social person who cooked his own meals, made his own coffee, 
could wire a studio, that sort of that sort of stuff. He was not completely undone by his afflictions, in other words, no Mr. Misery. He could be and behave like anyone else around the scene when he was in a good space, with people he cared about and trusted. Still, at bottom, he had, as Baum says, that abiding lack of interest in his own life. Some hooked cane from hell kept pulling him down, and as Gonson had also said, when he got dark, he got very, very dark. Elliot loved Joanna deeply, friends say, but the relationship was rocky. Although she obviously really cared about him, he broke up with her several times, part of a compulsion, according to friends, to undo or destroy the good things or people in his life. By 1997, the relationship was off and on. Elliot's interest in drugs, the main culprit, says Baum. When Krebs stated Baum, I was a bastard, he says, and I don't think Elliot improved on my record. So, overcoming his ambivalences, his doubts about whether it would really improve things, and to get distance from Baum and from all that Portland was starting to signify, Elliot finally did take off months before the fall from the cliff in North Carolina. And what he said before leaving for New York, the goodbyes he distributed were deeply alarming, weirdly prescient. Jason Mitchell recalls one conversation in the space room on Hawthorne the night before he left. Elliot said, Just so you know, if you get a call that something happened to me, don't be surprised. He went on making sure Mitchell knew it would be no one's fault telling him not to feel guilty, telling him again, as he did to more than one person, that there was nothing anyone could have done, nothing particular nothing particular that could have made any difference in whatever outcome materialized. To Mitchell, New York morphed into a place where Elliot felt freer to be self-destructive, a judgment no one close to him would have disagreed with. Looking back, New York seemed to Mitchell like the first in a sequence of steps toward catastrophe. At the same time, it could be hard to know what to take seriously and what to dismiss, or what to assume any responsibility for. Over time, feelings of resignation set in. As Gus said, he made his own choices when he bought the myth of being a rock star the one emblazoned by Cobain. It was just unbelievably disappointing. Gust compared the process to the kind of effort Gust compared the process to the kind of effortful posing people do in photographs. It's obvious when they are falling I'm sorry, guys. It's obvious when they are failing at what they're trying to be. Sam Coombs tentatively and very diplomatically suggested the same dynamic. Uh, Part of me is a little... This is weird, and I question whether it's sort of petty, but I suspect... I mean, Elliot was sort of actively involved in his own sort of myth-making, and I think he was interested in that, and it was something that I kind of frowned on. I always felt like I didn't want to facilitate that much... He wanted to be a certain way and be thought of in a certain way, and why not? Coombs band Quasi, who toured with Elliot in 1997, went so far to record a song, The Poisoned Well, that seems to address Elliot's no-win situation. After mentioning an artist's documentation of suicide, Coombs sings, You won't live long, but you may write the perfect song. Then, in reference to his reluctance to perpetuate Elliot's myth, Coombs concludes, Please excuse those who choose not to play along. Later, Elliot responded to this tune with one of his own, From a Poison Well. He accepted the appellation, then sent a message back. Okay, we have a page break. <clears throat> And welcome back to Media GTAO and Southwest Studios. Um, actually getting into the content. This video probably won't get many views because instead of holding on to it until the morning, like a normal person would do, I'm going to drop it like Beyonce in the middle of the night. Uh, so there'll be like five views. 
But for those of you who actually pay attention or stay up late like I do sometimes, um, yeah, you know, here's a little Easter egg for you. So, Elliot Smith deciding to go to New York, uh, being involved in his own myth-making. I promise, this episode I'm not going to do a whole lot of commentary, because I don't want to. Obviously, I had a lot of stuff to say this morning. But of course, we'll talk about Joanna Boehm real quick, and how some of Elliot's friends seem to not like her. Um... You know, some think she's a mystery. Some just, yeah, some just get a weird, creepy vibe from her. And we'll hear more about Joanna Baum. It is interesting, I was thinking today in that documentary, what is it called? Heaven Adores You. Um, which, in which, you know, they interview Baum herself and, you know, they talk about all the friends and people from the time talk about Elliot falling in love with Baum. Um, and then falling in love with each other. And it's a very different... I'm being a little quiet tonight, guys, because it's evening, it's evening, and their baby's sleeping, maybe. Actually, no, that baby moved out. That baby moved out, baby. <laughs> Either way, it's still evening. Um, in the documentary... Oh, what did I do now? You gotta turn your phone off, Media Gtail, when you're doing these things. Turn it over or something. You know, I never get messages ever, and then you get two within the space of trying to record this video. No one loves you till everyone loves you, when it, and it's inconvenient. So Joanna Baum in the Heaven Adores You documentary is painted in this very glowing kind of light, the angelic. You notice how whenever someone gets a girlfriend, it's like, oh. He got a girlfriend. He made it. Everyone's so happy. And it's so funny, you guys, because if she's she has to be pretty and thin. She has to be pretty and thin. Even your grandmother will be all proud of you, dude, if you have some pretty, even just a thin girl. Grandma doesn't want you bringing home some fat bitch. You know, women are the... Uh, no, I'm going to get back to content. But women are very much the... um harshest arbiters of other women, right? But anytime you land some chick who's halfway decent looking, the world smiles on you in your accomplishment, and everyone just gathers around the woman with the butterflies uh, on her shoulders, and, you know, you go out on a picnic, and your mom says, good job, honey, and gives you $20. But it's just this sense of approval, because some fucking bitch decided to make it your turn. And so, Elliot's friends are kind of saying those things, right? That they felt kind of weird about her. Um, I have to have a sip of my Heineken non-alcoholic. Because, damn it, I'm a non-alcoholic. In its essence, it's hard to see the move to New York as anything but a semi-planned descent into darkness. Not that there weren't good times, too. There were plenty of those. But Elliot always courted demons, as Krebs, as Krebs suggested. Only now he was shaking their hands, getting to know them intimately, hoping they might rub off. The fall was alarming, in particular its impulsivity, how Elliot simply bolted from the car bound for... I'm sorry, guys. How S Elliot simply bolted from the car bound for who knows where. Yet that was just one of several strange episodes. There were also fights or near fights in bars, news of which, when it traveled back to Portland, struck friends there as preposterous, bizarrely out of character. On occasion, he actively looked for fights. This was definitely new. In Portland, the most Elliot did in bars was play video poker, video poker or cry. In New York, it was fisticuffs. The one fight mentioned before was a reaction. As Gary, who was there, recalls, Some guy made a shitty comment about a girl and Elliot just lost it. He called the guy out, told him he was an asshole. There was pushing and shoving. Elliot punched the guy. And then Elliot got pushed down and ending up falling on a pint glass, which cut his back up badly. A photo taken by Autumn DeWild shows this wound. As he did after the cliff fall, Elliot refused to go to the hospital. He went home with Gary instead and fixed the wounds up himself as best he could. 
That altercation occurred at Max Fish on the Lower East Side. <clears throat> there was another run in there, too. Elliot had stepped out for a cigarette, and as it happened, Gary's car was parked out front. Elliot saw this guy taking a leak on my car. He said something like, go pee somewhere else. I think he got punched, Dorian says. Later, she told him, that was sweet, and thanks for looking out for your friends and all, but for Christ's sake, just let the guy pee on my car. It's not worth getting punched on the street for. Elliot was looking for trouble and finding it. Another confrontation had a similar vibe. It relates to a woman, Dorian in fact, but it's also excessive, in some ways comical. Elliot and Dorian were at another bar. It's how they tended to spend most nights, going out and drinking, not always to excess, playing pool, hanging around with friends. Suddenly, someone pulled her aside and told her she needed to go to the back. A fight was about to erupt. A lame guy she had been dating had entered the place. And without her knowing, while her back was literally turned, Elliot took it upon himself to go meet the guy and tell him to drink somewhere else. In this instance, the guy in question totally knew who Elliot was. He was a big fan of Elliot's and got really embarrassed. It was very sweet and funny, but I was like, you're going to get hurt someday. Not Gary meant by this particular guy who had the unusual experience of being ambushed by one of his idols, but by someone else some day who knew when. He would pick little fights with people, says Gary, implying that these three events were not exhaustive of every such run-in. And some days Elliot would get hurt when he tried that stuff out. There was something a little big brotherly about it, Gary says. Elliot was super aware, she adds, guessing that he saw the guy enter and decided he wasn't going to let him bum Dorian out. But a lot of times, and she never knew quite when, Gary says, things would go tits up and I would just have to go pick up the pieces of the mess he had just made. Not that bars were always sites of unwelcome, or welcome as the case may be, violence. Elliot hung out in them not just to possibly get beat up. Anger was always an issue, a leftover from childhood, but the fights were acts of self-destruction more than anything else. Not only to drink, which he was doing at home and alone, but to listen to music. Sometimes the music was live, but usually it was just jukebox stuff. If you went to a bar with him, Gary says, you always went to the jukebox, and you put your songs in, and you made sure your songs were coming pretty soon before you settled in somewhere for the night. Kind of just take over the jukebox. On occasion, he'd put as much as $40 in the machine. Selections might range from George Jones to Hank Williams Jr., from schmaltzy 70s soft rock like Chicago and Seals and Crofts to the Scorpions or Foreigner or Charlie Rich. As always, Elliot's affections could be surprising. He liked stuff uncool to like. He rejected the expertly crafted tune. Stevie Wonder was another favorite. Gary went to high school with Wonder's kids, and Elliot asked her over and over to tell the story about the blind man driving a car. <clears throat> if I saw Elliot getting really bummed out, Dorian says, I would say, do you want to hear the Stevie Wonder drives a car around the parking lot story again? Gary recalls one frequent haunt, a little neighborhood fisherman's bar called Harbor Casino in Jersey City, inhospitable to hipsters. It was torn down eventually, replaced by condos. She and Elliot were usually the youngest people in the place. They were gifted with their own nickname, the Beatles Kids, since those were the songs they picked out most often. But they were both also really obsessed with Roy Orbison, the golden-voiced songsmith. One thing Elliot did more than once, touching and faintly sad, was select Orbison's Running Scared, a song about rivals anxiously competing for a lover, then immediately leave. Gary recalls he would have to physically step out of the bar for it, 
I was always like, why did you play it if you're going to stand outside? He's like, it's such a beautiful song. I'm waiting for the day I can just sit here and not let it totally destroy me. Outside, he still got muffled, distant sounds of the music, but not the lyrics. There were plenty of fun times, too. Once he and Gary discussed which song, however cheesy, however vile, made them both so upset, so overcome by sadness that listening to the lyrics was a virtual impossibility. The answer? Phil Collins' Against All Odds. A different discussion centered on Joni Mitchell's notoriously dark album, Blue. One night by chance, Elliot stumbled across the record in Gary's collection. Immediately, he asked if she'd listened to it. She said no, she hadn't gotten around to putting it on and checking it out. Funnily, he was relieved. He made me promise never to touch it. He said it would change me forever. Stay away from it if you know what's good for you, was the basic, partly comical, message. But one night after drinking half a bottle of red wine, Dorian couldn't help herself. She slid blue out and stuck it on the turntable. Unexpectedly, Elliot walked in. Fuck, you did it, he said. You've now taken the irreversible journey of getting real bummed out on Joni's blue. One relatively unlikely subject was, of all things, clowns. Elliot had a hoax he talked about trying. He pictured driving to the Canadian border, ostensibly to play shows in Montreal or Toronto. As border guards stopped him, he'd step out in a clown outfit, proclaiming a desire to break into the Canadian clown world. He was prone to wearing squirting flowers, buying in buying rough approximations of clown shoes wherever he could find them. <clears throat> Once, he and Sean Krogan, visiting from Portland, rewrote lyrics to The Doors the End so the title character was a clown. <laughs> His shoes flopping on down the hall. I think it's kind of symbolic, says Gary. I think Elliot had a big inner clown that was dying to get out. It did get out more often than most imagined. No one ever underestimated Elliot's enormous talent for humor. It was a saving grace. But just like the stereotypical clown figure, when the face wasn't smiling, it was riven by tears. It's that duality, the clown's hidden dark side, the grimace under the grin, that scares so many kids shitless. As nights at the bars dilated into morning, more times than not, Elliot stayed on by himself after Dorian needed to take off. She was around 20 when she met him, and she wasn't a major partier. So when she couldn't extricate him in time for her to get them both home and to bed so she could wake at a reasonable hour in the morning before taking off her work, he would just stay out until whenever. More than once he was out all night at Luna Lounge, Bar 88, Blue and Gold. More than once he was shit-faced. He'd read Jennifer Toth's 1993 book, The Mole People, an allegedly true account of interviews with tunnel dwellers, homeless people who lived in ordered tribes underground, in subways or abandoned structures. Legend had it that there were hundreds of these groups with cultural traits, formed complex societies, pseudo-families with codes of conduct siphoning electricity from city grids. Toth took heat for the book. Claims were made that her stories were apocryphal. Attempts to verify met with little success. Still, Elliot was curious. Gary discovered that on nights he was drunk and out alone, with no one out to keep him in check or look out for his best interests, he'd go down into the subways, searching out these communities of people living in hiding. And he did it shit-faced. It's so dangerous, I can't even fathom, she said. My worst nightmare is falling off a subway platform, let alone crawling down one and walking through the tunnels. He never did find what he was after. He made no contact with tunnel dwellers. But as Gary remembers, there was so much like that, playing with fire, 
testing his limits and testing fate down there. The kind of thing, in other words, he told Mitchell he went to New York to do. In Gary's view, all the critic at all the critical attention, the push to sell records, still at best only very mildly successful commercially, the fans, the performances, the music itself, none of those things erase the fact that he had all this stuff he just couldn't deal with. It didn't make it any better, it didn't make it any easier to go through the day. Like at the end of the day, just let the people who bummed you out leave your head. That is what Elliot was not able to do. The people stayed in his head. They kept bumming him out. Initially, Dorian was Elliot's first and only friend in New York. They were never more than friends, but as she says, I was a little confused on occasion about his feelings for me. Mainly, he assumed the role of big brother protector. He watched out for her, offered advice. He had her back, always. At the same time, he hated every boyfriend I ever had, she says, an attitude suggesting he may have felt an attraction of some sort, or else simply distrusted the motives of men. He was an exceptional people reader, according to Gary. He had an acute sense of what people were thinking or feeling at any any given moment. He sized them up quickly and often unerringly. So the guys trying to get close to Dorian he judged more often than not to be suspect. He wanted closeness. He was feeling alone. Perhaps then a part of him wondered whether he and Dorian might grow to be more than friends. After all, the breakup with Joanna had been devastating. They'd agreed to separate, Gary recalls, and to seek a distance aimed at guaranteeing the relationship's demise. As Elliot had taken off for New York, Joanna relocated to Chicago. They committed mutually to not seeing each other. It was too difficult otherwise. But Elliot was desperate for love, Dorian says. And at some point while touring in the Northeast, he managed to find it, at least temporarily. At a show, he met a girl named Amity. Gary never knew her well and can't remember her last name. She seemed to be from somewhere in New England. One day, Elliot phoned to ask whether she could stay for a while in New York, and as she always did, Dorian said, fine. This new girl was extremely cute, lovely and adorable, very sweet, but also Gary and most others felt very young. She was bright-eyed and eager, yet obviously unsophisticated, kind of high-def version of the callow innocent. A virtual Joanna antithesis, Amity's dissimilarity from Bohm instantly struck Dorian as totally insane. She made no sense. She wasn't the kind of person anyone imagined Elliot being into. Whatever the case, he was smitten. Pete Krebs recalls him flashing around a photograph proudly, almost in disbelief at his good fortune in nabbing her. She'd never been to New York, Gary recalls, so when she arrived, she wanted to do all the usual touristy things with Elliot. All the usual touristy things, which Elliot, very uncharacteristically, tried arranging, working hard to put together an itinerary. This wasn't the sort of thing Elliot was good at or ever did. That he put the effort in indicates his degree of devotion. They toured the city, checked out all the obligatory sights and scenes. It was puppy love, cute and surprising to see, but it did not last long, nor did it end at all badly. For one thing, Elliot was too busy touring. His life was still way too up in the air, Gary says. He hadn't yet made serious money, so he scrambled always to make ends meet. He was therefore hardly in a position to commit to anybody, as Dorian saw it. The flirtation, however exciting and affirming at the time, ran its course. Love came, but in the moment it was impossible to imagine a way of turning to imagine a way of turning it into something viable. What remained in the end was what often remained. A song titled simply Amity. In it, Elliot notes Amity's Hello Kitty cuteness. 
She catches stars in her arms, and as they walk New York City together, she feels like a lucky charm, her freshness contrasting his own inner junk made by God. The lyrics are succinct, hopeful, and rapt. But the song never comes off. In fact, it may be one of Elliot's few failures. As he said, he liked to write when unhappy. Happiness this time derailed the music. What he seems to want to do most in the tune is repeat her name, which he does on two separate occasions, a lucky seven times each. <clears throat> in interviews, Elliot laughed the song off, although not without adding an element of pathos. Uh, it's just a big rock song, he told Pamela Chellen. It's a pretty simple song. It's not so much about the words themselves, but more about how the whole thing sounds. Friends saw through to the tune's true meaning, suggesting it sounded like I was trying to get something romantic going with someone. Elliot confided, it's a person I know, then added, with a painful honesty characteristic of his approach to even the most superficial interviews. It was supposed to be... You're really fun to be with, and I really like you a lot because of that, but I am really, really depressed. But I don't think it came across when I said ready to go. It was supposed to mean tired of living. The interviewer stopped short. Oh, she replied, apparently startled. Like, ready to check out of this world? Yeah. Elliot answered. I was saying, I really like you, and it's really great to hang out with someone who is happy and easy going, but I don't feel like that, and I can't be that way. This was the usual posture. His feeling, once eternally returning, was that he ought not commit to lovers, ought to refuse their love even, no matter how promising or sincere, because his plan was to not be around for long. It was a painful attitude to adopt toward relationships, but at least it was fair and honest driven by a desire not to cause more hurt than necessary. But it more or less guaranteed isolation. The hoped-for incantation, therefore, brought no lasting, revivifying genie from the bottle. Amity was a sweet distraction, an unspoiled partial antidote, but true cure was too much to risk imagining. There would be more Joanna replacements, but these were years off, and marked, as always, by extreme approach-avoidance conflicts. Lacking someone in whom he might locate some small degree of solace, some possibility of comfort, intimacy, and affection, Elliot's mood darkened even more. Without quite knowing it, he was on a track to rock bottom into a life-altering confrontation. The tour kept taking its toll, different cities every night, different hushed audiences to gauge and win over. And because Dorian was available and sympathetic, willing to listen even if she didn't always quite know what to say, Elliot fell into the habit of calling her almost every single night, usually late, from phone booths in whatever city he happened to find himself in. These talks go on for hours well past the time when Gary needed to be in bed sleeping, resting up for work the next day. Her role, it seemed to Gary, was pseudo-therapist, and it was rarely easy. She felt uncertain out of her depth, but she did what she could. Elliot was in a tough spot emotionally, and he needed someone in whom he could confide, someone he trusted, who would not find fault. The subjects were Joanna, his darkening mood, his drinking, and often to a degree that was becoming routine, the possibility of suicide. To hear all this was sad and frightening. There were times, no doubt, when Dorian wasn't sure Elliot would survive to see the next day. At last, after many such conversations circling around the same painful nuclei, Elliot sent Dorian an email. He laid out where he was where he was at, 
saying in the end that he could not take it any longer and that he was not sure how much longer he could be in the world. What the message seemed to say was goodbye. There was a conclusiveness to it. Freaked out and feeling as if something needed to be done, feeling also that things had progressed had progressed to such a point that she could not shoulder the burden on her own. Gary shared the email with her boss at Gurley Action, Felice Ecker. The immediate question was what to do. Should they take action or should they hold off for the time being? Ecker panicked, as Gary recalls. Her impulse was to contact Slim Moon at Kill Rockstars, Elliot's label, and Margaret Middleman. Dorian wasn't on board. I knew that wasn't going to sit well with Elliot. He didn't like being told what to do, ever. He was very stubborn. He was also extremely mindful about what he needed. Instantly, she regretted showing Ecker the email. I was conflicted, says Gary. It seemed like a betrayal of trust. At the time, as far as I knew, he was only talking about these things with me. I worried he'd never confide to anyone again. Plus, I had no faith in what the adults in this situation, those on the music industry side of things, were going to decide to do. Business interests, represented by people who weren't first and foremost Elliot's friends, had one set of concerns. Those he was truly close to, who knew him best and understood what kinds of reactions might backfire, had different competing loyalties. Yet now, although the two groups didn't see eye to eye, they were in league. Gary felt like a kid who had told on a friend to grown-ups. Moon was very much on high alert, says Gary. He'd seen other musicians die, so he took the news extremely seriously. He did not want to repeat. The decision, chiefly his, was to stage an intervention, the one occurring four or five months prior to Elliot's Oscar nomination, the storm before the calm. Moon reached out to a Long Island specialist named Lou Cox, who had also worked with Aerosmith years before. Pressure was applied to Gary to be there, but at first she was reluctant. She didn't think it would work for one. She also doubted it was the right thing to do. Still, for Elliot's sake, and despite her fear that he'd see her as a betrayer, she finally relented. Others from the friend faction were also convinced to join in. Sam Coombs' new band Quasi had been playing dates with Elliot, so he and Janet Weiss were approached. Joanna, Neil Gust, and Rebecca Gates, another Portland friend who had sung backup on the song St. Ides Heaven, all agreed to be present as well. From the business end, there was Moon, Felice Ecker, and as Gary recalls, Ellen Stewart, Elliot's booking agent. The process was typical. Everyone spent two days with Cox prepping. He laid out what he felt needed to happen. The timing, the organization, the requirement to be firm and direct, but supportive. In short, the basic intervention algorithm. Per custom, there was a strict secrecy element no one felt particularly comfortable with. Elliot would not know in advance what was going on. The event was to be, by its very nature, an ambush. Gary says, We were supposed to say all the things he had done that had worried us to share our stories. It was supposed to include stuff he'd done in Portland, too, not just in New York. The whole time I was like, this is going to fucking backfire colossally. The event, lasting several hours, was staged in the middle of the 97 tour in Chicago, sometime in late July at the home of Rebecca Gates. Everyone assembled in Gates' kitchen, waiting. What Elliot had been told, Gary isn't sure by whom, was that he'd, was that he'd be having lunch there. At no point did he apparently suspect what was in store. Yet as he walked into the room, he instantly recognized what was up, Gary says, and he was not happy. Cox took the lead as planned. He gave the equivalent of an introductory speech. He told Elliot everyone was there because they loved him. He outlined the format of the proceedings. He gave an overview of the timeline and of the goals for the meeting. 
and at the end of this no doubt shocking and for Elliot infuriating prologue, Elliot decided to stay in the room and listen. The friends present had talked beforehand. They all agreed they were there for support only, not to dogmatically declare Elliot needed to do anything specific, not, in other words, to strong arm him, because they knew that was a tactic he'd reject categorically. Their message was, whatever you choose to do, we love and support you. They also told him, in words that made an impact, Gary felt, since they spoke to a major portion of the conflict, that if he were feeling shitty, emotionally exhausted and physically exhausted, he didn't need to keep up the tour. We said he could put the whole thing on hold. He could just stop the train. For now, or for forever. This was a sentiment Elliot appreciated, Gary believes. It made him more responsive and a little more able to listen to the rest. Then the stories came. Industry people weighed in first. Friends at the very end. As people spoke, Gary felt unanticipated relief. She realized that what had been happening was not new. Everyone recounted experiences similar to hers. In some vague way, that fact made her feel less alone. All of it, the depressions, the suicidal thoughts, the recklessness, the low self-regard had been happening off and on for years. She now recognized. It wasn't a New York thing. It wasn't specific to her. The burden was no longer hers, uniquely to make sense of and absorb. It was anything but easy, and Elliot was very angry, incensed at being blindsided, enraged by the various sets of motives in play, and the presumptuousness of people thinking they knew what was best for him or what he somehow needed to do as if he couldn't deal with his own inner torment, something he'd been living with and managing, not always well of course, for nearly a decade. But at the end of the ordeal, as a plan was presented, Elliot agreed to try following it, which shocked Dorian. Although he was unwilling to promise complete compliance, Cox had already selected a hospital, a place in Arizona called Sierra Tucson, a residential program founded in the mid-1980s, specializing in what it called coexisting disorders, addictions combined with trauma, mood disorders, chronic pain, eating disorders. That angle had seemed appropriate. Sierra Tucson was not only a detox center. It was, in essence, a glorified psych unit with a less institutionalized veneer. The twin targets would be Elliot's depression and his drinking, a combination usually referred to as a dual diagnosis. He was dealing with what clinicians sometimes refer to as the holy trinity, addiction, suicidal thinking, and mood disorder. Length of stay at the facility varied according to individual circumstance, but the minimum required commitment was 30 days which might stretch to 90 or more in rare cases. Most rooms were doubles. There was breakfast at the ungodly hour of 6.45, earlier for eating disorder patients, then lectures, groups, community meetings, one-to-ones, and family work if necessary, followed by dinner at 5 and the end of programming at 9 or 9.30. Everyone knew, except maybe Cox, that this was precisely the sort of top-down imposed structure Elliot detested. It was foreign to his nature. He almost never did anything on schedule. The odds he'd shift the experience into a turning point, a personal epiphany, were slim at best. As Gary said, and she was hardly alone, I didn't think it would work to begin with. But he agreed to go. He agreed to try. The deal was that he'd play a handful of additional dates up to a knitting factory gig in New York, then fly to Arizona along with Joanna sometime in early September 1997. It was unusual. Typically, interventions conclude with the patient flying to treatment immediately, leaving no opportunity for backsliding. But it had to do. It beat the alternative, doing nothing, extending the status quo. At the designated time Elliot got on the plane, he checked into the glorified hospital.
He started the program, but he did not stay. He bailed. By this time, booze had become his primary mood stabilizer, his mood defeater. It was the one reliable path to his most cherished state, painless oblivion. As he'd put it in Heat Miser's plainclothes man, alcohol was the only thing he really needed, something that will treat me okay and wouldn't say the things you'd say. Drink was a faithful friend. The booze abided, always, and it didn't talk back. It was kind, dependable. On a hot September day in New York, Gary had gone to the beach with a friend. As she returned home and opened the door to the apartment, there, to her partial surprise, was Elliot sitting in the living room. Hey, I'm home, he said. I decided I couldn't do it. Gary's response was disappointment mixed with fear about what might happen next, how the pattern might reinstate itself, that entrenched holy trinity. But as she'd insisted all along from the plan's inception, I never had any disbelief that it was going to work. Excuse me, sorry. I never had any belief it was going to work. He gave the typical Elliot reasons for discharging. He didn't like the staff or patients. There was no rapport. And he found the group therapies, crafts and so on, occupational therapy type interventions, annoying. Making collages from magazine pictures cut out with safety scissors, constructing welcome mats to take home for later use, building tiny painted jewelry boxes, all of it struck him as time-wasting and ridiculous. He didn't see the point. His natural bent was skeptical, and there was plenty to be skeptical about at Sierra Tucson. Nevertheless, Dorian sought whatever silver lining she could in the experience. Maybe he knew now the jig is up, she concluded hopefully. He'd gotten the message that people believed he was in trouble, so perhaps he would translate into internally executed change. It seemed like the most anyone could hope for, given how things had turned out. The plan that evening had been to meet Janet Weiss for drinks. <clears throat> Elliot asked to tag along. Weiss naturally surprised to see him. But the two had a long talk. Elliot wanted to go and tell her what had happened, Gary says, to try explaining the change of course. As days went on, Elliot was anything but contrite. His mode was not apologetic. He expressed little guilt. What he was for weeks and months thereafter was angry. What I had to do now, Gary says, was deal with his anger. He wasn't angry at me at all for some reason. But basically he felt like the whole response was too reactionary. Mostly he was angry at Slim. He wasn't nearly as mad at anyone else. He needed to direct his anger somewhere and Slim got it. He would keep getting it too. That particular relationship never healed. Others would, without great difficulty, but from here on out, Elliot cut Moon off. And in time, his deal with Kill Rock Stars would also go by the wayside. What exactly Elliot was into besides alcohol proved in, in mid-1997, hard to figure out. Everyone smoked dope, of course, but in New York, Elliot's tendency was to abstain. Weed made him too paranoid, Gary recalls. As for harder drugs, speed, cocaine, meth, heroin, the ones he'd implied he might try upon leaving Portland, Gary wasn't directly aware of those being any kind of issue. Vaguely, she recalled Elliot mentioning sampling heroin even in college, but that was all he'd said. Never did she find him in a state suggesting more than drunkenness. Yet as she explains, I was really young and I had no reference point for when things were getting out of control. His attitude toward her wavered, too. On one hand, he was comfortable in the friendship, inclined to confide freely. On the other, he was protective, especially as far as knowing me too much. So he could have been using for all Dorian knew, but keeping it secret. He wasn't around a lot, and she didn't know all of his acquaintances, so what he was up to in the middle of the night as Gary slept was a bit of mystery. 
any drug use, she says, he may have kept compartmentalized. At any rate, he did not go to Sierra Tucson for anything like heroin addiction. It was the drinking and the expression of suicidal ideas that led to the intervention, not a concern relating to harder drugs. Those would come soon enough. But in New York, he was not a junkie. As far as years and a short life go, 1997 may have been Elliot's most eventful. He had signed with a new label, although that situation would quickly change. Either or was an artistic triumph, but no commercial juggernaut. He was back on the East Coast, heartbroken over ending a uniquely significant relationship. There had been the cliff fall, the intervention, the stint at Sierra Tucson. It was a bewildering mixture of very good and very bad. But more good was imminent. Soon it would be Oscar time. As he stepped onto that worldwide stage in his white suit, holding nothing but his guitar for protection, almost undone by the sight of rotund Jack Nicholson feet away, it could have only seemed, as it did to friends around the late around the nation, like a moon landing. How did he get there? What did it mean? The crowd took in the nervous kid next door, someone they'd babysat, someone they'd coached on a soccer team. The lyrics might have been a tip-off if anyone paid attention, but chances are no one inferred the troublemaker below, the inner demon whose taste in suits was anything but white. White. 